Support for the Living Well with MS podcast is provided by Overcoming MS, a global charity registered in the United States, United Kingdom and Australia, whose mission is to educate, support and empower people with MS in evidence-based lifestyle and medication choices that can improve their health outcomes. Please visit our website at www.overcomingms.org to learn more about our work and hear directly from people around the world about the positive impact Overcoming MS has made on their lives. Now, on to today's episode. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the world of vitamin D and other supplements. Joining me today is Dr. Connor Curley. Connor was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2003 at the age of 15. Up to that point, Connor was a healthy athlete and student. Inspired by his own circumstances, Connor went on to receive a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and dietetics from Trinity College Dublin in 2010 and a PhD from University College Dublin in 2016. Connor has worked in diverse research and clinical settings in Ireland and Washington DC. Currently, he is developing an all-natural nutrition preparation to deliver key nutrients directly to the brain. Now, Connor is symptom-free, relapse-free, medication-free and still playing several sports, demonstrating the power of lifestyle choices. So, Connor, why is vitamin D important in general to the general population? Yeah, so um, vitamin D, like all vitamins, is uh, absolutely essential for humans. Um, And originally it was thought to be only really important for bone health. One of the major roles of vitamin D is to increase our absorption of calcium. Um, And we know that calcium is extremely important, for example, for bone health. Um, but we know that vitamin D has lots of additional roles and nearly we're finding out new new uh, new applications of vitamin D all the time. Um, so it turns out there's vitamin D receptors in every single cell in the body, um, you know, within the brain, within the spinal cord, within the breast, within the prostate. And why else would it be there except if it had a function? And we're discovering these functions on a daily basis. Um, well, maybe not daily, but on a regular basis. Um, and in terms of specific to MS, we know that vitamin D has a huge role in regulating immune function. So um, the way I like to explain it to my patients is almost making the immune system smarter, not just stronger, working harder. It actually works smarter. So it kind of does more of the right thing. And so we know that um, people with MS tend to have low vitamin D levels, but could it be a cause and effect situation? Could it be that MS causes low vitamin D rather than low vitamin D causing MS? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I suppose um, vitamin D has had an added layer of um, kind of complexity because unlike most vitamins, the major source of vitamin D for almost all humans on the planet is from sun exposure, not directly from food. Whereas most vitamins or all vitamins really we get from mostly from food. And so this means that anybody for whatever reason who doesn't get a lot of sun, whether it be because of where they live or because of their lifestyle or maybe because their illness prevents them from getting sun, they can have low vitamin D levels. But of course, that's the disease causing low vitamin D levels. So a simple uh, um, a simple example could be, you know, if somebody's bed bound and, um, you know, maybe with severe MS or, you know, whatever else it is they're unlikely to be getting a lot of sun and thereby their vitamin D levels could be low. Um, And we've seen that uh, almost every disease has been linked to vitamin D levels, but actually providing vitamin D supplementation does not provide benefit in in many diseases. However, MS um, being a little bit different, um, being an autoimmune disease associated with a dysregulated immune function, it does actually seem that vitamin D is particularly important in autoimmune diseases and, and especially MS. So although it is possible that, you know, someone with um, MS and disability may not go outdoors or may, may be dressed up and, and, and not expose their skin when they do go outdoors, um, it does seem that vitamin D um, is important directly for, um, for MS. For um, people who've got children who obviously got an increased risk of getting MS, charged with someone with MS. Um, is it worthwhile that they supplement? Is there a potential that they could um, lower their risk of getting MS by supplementing with vitamin D? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question again. Um, and there is some really good data showing that um, vitamin D, higher vitamin D levels are protective against MS. So I think this is certainly um, if somebody, um, you know, if there's a, a genetic history and somebody's worried about their children being at risk of MS, 
it's certainly worth um, considering vitamin D supplementation and at the very least having vitamin D levels measured. Um, one of the initial studies from Harvard from probably about 15 years ago at this stage showed a 40% reduction which is minimal vitamin D um, supplementation in terms of MS risk. So 40% decreased risk of MS um, by taking 400 units of vitamin D um, on a daily basis. Um, a Harvard study showed that, and lots of uh, studies have, have kind of uh, shown the same thing since. Um, I suppose, as I say, because the major source of vitamin D is sun exposure, um, this means that um, in modern lifestyle, when people maybe don't get as much sun as we would like, and also, um, you know, I'm here in Ireland where we don't get a lot of sun, and um, that vitamin D can be um, can be certainly a nutrient of concern. Um, but you know, thankfully, it's easy to measure and it's also easy to correct and um, taking uh, targeted supplementation, which is uh, really quite safe. And how would you go about measuring your vitamin D level? <clears throat> yeah, um, so there are two ways to measure um, vitamin D in the blood. Uh, it turns out one of these is the hormonal form, which we don't really want to, that's not really what we want to look for. We want to look for a form called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And this is often abbreviated as just 25-OHD. Um, and most um, physicians can measure this very easily, whether it be your primary care physician or your general practitioner or your hospital-based um, um, physician. They can measure this really quite easily and quite cheaply. Um, and I would usually recommend getting uh, this checked twice a year for somebody with MS or, or at risk of MS, maybe once towards the end of summer and once towards the end of winter. And it would kind of, kind of give a person a, a good handle on you know, if they're getting enough vitamin D and if not what strategies they can they can take is it quite quick to to react so if you took a lot of vitamin so so over the summer if if you had a test in september it will have reacted to the vitamin d you've got I mean, is it is it on a daily basis weekly monthly how yeah so i mean if if you took a huge amount of vitamin d today you you probably could see a fairly uh, significant change in your blood, blood sorry your blood level tomorrow um but Generally, um, we don't really want to look at daily changes. Um, what's really fascinating is multiple studies, in, including some of my own here in Ireland, have shown that the highest level of vitamin D will be in September time, in other words, at the end of summer. And for our colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, um, that would be the inverse at the end of March, would be the, the highest levels at the end of their summer, and vice versa, then the lowest levels for in Ireland and, and the UK and, and North America would generally be in um, in March time, whereas in the in Australia, the lowest levels would generally be in September at the end of their uh, their summer. So you do build it up over a period of time? Absolutely. So vitamin D is what we call a fat-soluble vitamin, and this means that we can store it. Um, it turns out that what, what we call it, in, in science terms, we call it the half-life of vitamin D. In other words, if your level is 100, after about 30 days, um, that will reduce to about 50 um, if you don't get any, any extra vitamin D from any source. After another 30 days, it will generally decrease by another 50%. So in other words, it will go from 50 down to 25 and so on and so forth. And this, this kind of uh, demonstrates that if you have a high level at the end of summer, um, that throughout the winter there will be a store you won't end up with frank vitamin D deficiency but you may end up with low levels of vitamin D which can impact things like your bone health and your immune function okay and what what's you mentioned sort of levels there what what would a healthy level of vitamin D be yeah so um in general this can be a little bit controversial because um there's different societies medical and scientific societies around the world um, but generally um in terms of um in terms of avoiding deficiency, we would generally look to be above 50 um, nanomoles per liter. Um, um, and in, um, in places like America, um, the, the reference range changes, and that would generally be 20 nanograms per milliliter. Um, so there are different, two different ways to talk about uh, vitamin D levels. Um, but that's to avoid deficiency. If we want to look at optimal immune function, we're probably... Um, we're probably looking at above 75 um, nanomoles per liter. And in fact, um, overcoming MS um, recommends above 150 nanomoles per liter. And that's 60 nanograms per milliliter in the US. And is there, what about an upper limit? Would you, so if, if you were at 175, you think, okay, well, that's fine. But then if you were at 275, would that cause a potential issue? Would you worry about having it too high? 
Yeah, absolutely. So as I say, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, which basically, um, you know, for the terms of toxicity means that we can store it in our body. And in theory, it can build up over time and be stored in our fat tissues and, and cause toxicity. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our blood level, we're probably looking at a level of about 350 nanomoles per liter um, for vitamin D toxicity. However, what we need to consider is what is the benefit and what is the risk of having a, a high vitamin D level, like around 250 nanomoles um, per liter or 100 nanograms per milliliter in, in the U.S., um, and to my mind, um, there is a, a potential of harm and there is not a, a proven benefit. So I, w I wouldn't advise people to go quite that high, um, but um, <clears throat> in around 150 nanomoles as, as overcoming MS um, does seem to be really quite safe. So I, I treat, try to keep mine between 150 and 200. Yeah. Um, and that seems that's a reasonable amount, is it? Yeah, um, I think, you know, in around 100 to 150 is, is probably a, a pretty good place to be. Um, you know, we do we do know from studies looking at uh, populations who live um, who live, for example, uh, as hunter gatherers in the in the in the in the, in, the, um, <clears throat> in um, original um, original sort of circumstances that their blood levels are generally higher than 100 nanomoles per liter. Um, and they certainly don't have any uh, problems at all. And interestingly, their vitamin D comes solely um, or mostly from the sun. And um, th there's more than one type of vitamin D. So what, what type of vitamin D should we be taking? There are. So the, the main two forms of vitamin D2, vitamin D or vitamin D2, also called ergocalciferol, and vitamin D3, also called colocalciferol. So it turns out that vitamin D3 is the form of, of vitamin D our bodies make when we get sun. And this is also the form of vitamin D, which is in animal-based foods like, like fatty fish, like salmon. It also turns out that vitamin D2 is the kind of the plant-based form, which we can find in, in certain mushrooms and certain supplements. Um, <clears throat> but research has shown that vitamin D3 is much more um, much more effective um, both in raising vitamin D levels and also in a, actually having a clinical effect, for example, on the immune system. Um, so if a person has a choice, I would always go for vitamin D3 um, over vitamin D2. Okay, and, and what about getting uh, vitamin D at, directly from the sun? I was saying that's how you, get vit you make vitamin D when you get sun exposure. So what about sun exposure as a means of getting vitamin D? Yeah, so with my patients, I recommend getting moderate, sensible sun exposure. So what do I mean by moderate and sensible? Um, so really, um, vitamin D, uh, with, in terms of the sun, we should never burn. Or the aim is not to burn, to, to redden our skin and cause uh, skin damage. Um, but certainly, um, <clears throat> I advise my patients to get some moderate sun, and that's what I, uh, that's what I uh, practice myself. So there's, there's a very simple rule um, that any uh, listeners can, can uh, maybe um, take heed of, and it's basically you want to look at your shadow. If you're outside in the sun and it's sunny, you can see your shadow on the ground. You want your shadow to be the same size as, as your body or, or smaller. So in other words, um, if the sun is quite high in the sky, your shadow will be quite short, and this means that you're make, you can make vitamin D. But if your shadow is quite long, this means the sun's quite low in the sky and it's not very strong and you're not going to be able to make vitamin D. What's interesting is we generally need to expose, um, uh, I always say naked skin, but I'm not advising people to walk around naked, but <laughs> naked skin. Um, so in other words, clothes block the effect of, of sunlight on, vit on vitamin D production. Similarly, um, there's some good data showing that uh, sunscreen blocks it as well. Um, now that's um, been a little bit controversial, but it does seem that sunscreen um, can in fact block vitamin D production from, from sunshine. Similarly, being in the shade, being behind glass, all of these factors can, uh, can, uh, can, um, can certainly influence vitamin D production from the sun. Um, so, for example, if somebody uh, can get out and read a book for, for 20 minutes, um, you know, if they can go for a walk on the beach or in the park for 20 minutes and just uh, expose some, some skin um, <clears throat> again, what I usually advise for, for my patients is um, to expose more skin for less time. In other words, to go out in shorts and a vest or a swimming suit or whatever for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, as opposed to going out with less skin, like just your face and arm showing for maybe an hour or two hours. Um, because really interestingly, it's each unit of skin um, has a capacity to produce vitamin D. 
And once that unit of skin, for example, let's say your, your hands, once your hands have made enough vitamin D, it doesn't matter if you leave your hands out for one hour or two hours, it, the vitamin D is produced. Whereas if you roll up your sleeves and then expose your arms, your arms can then start producing vitamin D. So as I say, you want to have a short shadow and you want to expose more skin for less time. And the final thing interesting for anybody um, who's, who's following the Overcoming MS program is that it does seem that certain foods can help um, can help protect the skin from within. And these would be mostly things like fruits and vegetables and, and tea and um, things like that um, can protect the skin from the inside. So sorry, protect the skin from <laughs> sun exposure? Yeah, from 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 sun damage as such. Um, so we know that um, you know certain nutrients are picked up by the skin, um, from, again from within, and um, can can contribute to healthy skin and, and pr- protecting the skin against harmful ultraviolet uh, radiation. And um, of course, sun, like anything, can be abused and, and can be harmful. But you know, again, I would often say something like water. If we drink, um, you know, twenty gallons of water, that could be really really harmful. But nobody says don't drink water. So again, with sun, we just need to have a little bit of sense and, and not to um, not to overdo it. But certainly, um, I think some sun is 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 quite healthy. So with the the fact that sun cream um, probably has an effect in blocking vitamin D production, does it make sense to go out in the sun, say you're on holiday, rather than the traditional, if you like, where you put your sun cream on before you leave your apartment? Um, yes. and then the advice actually was to sort of some let it soak in sort of five or ten minutes before you go out in the sun at all you'd have you'd be fully covered in fact 50 um would you say it makes sense to say go out for 20 minutes and then put sun cream on yeah so unfortunately yeah this is where it gets really complicated because you know someone's on holiday trying to chill out and enjoy themselves or they're going to go out for 20 minutes and then come back in and then put on the sunscreen and then go back out again um that's the way I would do it, um, but, uh, you know, does that always suit um, each person's, uh, you know, preferences and so on and, and their schedule? Um, unfortunately, um, there's no easy answer, um, but, you know, what you've just mentioned it would be would be a fairly good strategy, but, of course, it gets complex in terms of uh, actually doing it. Um, what I would just mention is that um, for someone with, uh, with kind of light Caucasian skin, you know, 20 minutes of sun exposure in a bathing suit can um, can produce about 20,000 units of vitamin D. Um, and that's really quite a lot. Um, for example, um, a glass of milk, which is fortified with vitamin D, might contain 100 units. So 100 units in a glass of milk are 20,000 units from 20 minutes of sun. I, I know which one I'd rather. <laughs> <clears throat> So, for example, if someone's on holiday, maybe they can go out on the sun maybe twice a week um, with no sunscreen for about 20 minutes and then put the sunscreen on, but maybe not have to worry about it the other days. Or, um, You know, people generally will, will have to think about their own strategy. But your body won't naturally overproduce because you said once an area of skin has like, produced yeah. its amount, it'll stop. But, but if you said so, after 20 minutes, you actually might produce 20,000 units, um, it presume your body wouldn't actually give you any form of toxicity from having too much yep you're absolutely right and again this is this is really interesting um from kind of an evolutionary point of view so it turns out that as we mentioned briefly before that you know it is possible to get vitamin d toxicity from you know from inappropriate supplementation but it's not possible to get um excess vitamin d um from from sun exposure so you know being out in the sun all day every day may not be very good for your skin um, but it's certainly not going to contribute to uh, to your vitamin D levels going too high. And when were you saying you, you your each area of skin will have a maximum amount? When does that get reset? So does it is it sort of overnight? Yeah, it seems to be roughly within about a twenty four hour period of time. Um, roughly about twenty four hours. In the UK, certainly, I, I don't know if this applies everywhere, but they they traditionally it's, it's changing somewhat in the last couple of years but traditionally were um happy with quite low levels of vitamin d like much much lower than we're talking about um and then if you were at this very very low levels if you're sort of people with 25 nanomoles per liter and then they would say oh you should supplement you know a, a thousand iu to, to try and bring that up they, they seem to be very reticent um to go with higher levels and certainly i mean my my neurologist who's quite um forward thinking was still talking about oh you should probably supplement a thousand iu a day 
and really is finds anything above that extraordinary when you see when you hear a lot of people on with the OMS protocol on 5,000 or 10,000 IUs a day. So should we follow the doctor's advice? I mean, if a, a general practitioner, um, would you say, okay, well, they seem to know what they're talking about. I've got a level of 25 nanomoles and they're saying take 1,000 IUs. Um, is, it, is it safe to go off and do our own thing, if you like? Um, I mean, I would be a little bit cautious of uh, going off and doing your own thing all the time. Um, as I say, it is possible to overdo it on, on vitamin D, absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, vitamin D uh, response to supplements, generally, the lower your level when you start, the, the, the more uh, pronounced the response. So if somebody starts at 25 nanomoles per litre and takes 1,000 units, um, you know, they might quickly go up to 60 or 70 nanomoles per litre. Whereas if somebody started out at, you know, 75 nanomoles per litre and started taking 1,000 units a day, um, it probably would have little impact. Um, what's really interesting about vitamin D is the response seems to be very individualised. So, for example, I did a study here in children with asthma, um, giving them 2,000 units per day. Now, these were children, not adults, so 2,000 units was, was quite a, a decent dose. And some children's levels went up quite significantly. Some children's levels didn't change, but some children's levels actually went down. So they were taking 2,000 units a day and their level went down. Um, and we measured their, their, their levels at the start and at the end of the study. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you that is because, you know, everybody's response can be individualized. And that's why it can be important to keep an eye on, on your, um, on your uh, blood, blood level. Um, you know, if, if I was to take a thousand units a day, I might increase by up to 10, 10 nanomoles or something like that, up to, let's say, 80 or 90. But somebody else may not increase at all and somebody else may decrease and so on. And that's kind of the value of, um, of knowing your blood level. So you're saying it's worth checking every six months. But to start off with, until you get to a, a sort of happy, stable level, would you check just to see what it is initially? OK, what is it after a month of supplementing maybe? And just to try and tailor does it need it needs to be personally tailored i take it to to each individual <clears throat> so generally what i would recommend is maybe getting a check every two to three months once you start a supplement regimen and um, there's very little um there's very little benefit to be had from uh measuring a tune more, much more often than that for example if somebody was to take a thousand units per day, it might take two to three months for their levels to stabilize. So if you measure it after a month, it's not really telling you the full response. It's just telling you where it's getting, where it's going to go to. Um, you know, it's going to be increasing all the time, potentially at least. Um, so if somebody out there is, is just starting a vitamin D or has just changed their vitamin D dose or something like that, I would say stick to a, um, a, a consistent dose on a daily basis and measured maybe after two to three months. Okay. Um, and is there anything else we should know about vitamin D before we move on? Yeah, and um, there's a couple of interesting things I just wanted to point out um, about vitamin D. So as I say, vitamin D is fat soluble, and that means that it's best absorbed when you take it in the, with a meal, which contains some, some fats. Um, so I know a lot of people um, on the Overcoming MS program may be taking flaxseed oil or maybe taking some oily fish or maybe eating some seeds and nuts. So just generally having a, a breakfast, lunch or dinner, including some of these fats, that's the best time to take vitamin D as opposed to taking it fasting. Um, so that's one um, kind of interesting thing um, <clears throat> about vitamin D. The second thing I just wanted to mention about vitamin D um, was that as I mentioned at the very start, vitamin D increases absorption of calcium. And generally, um, you know, a lot of medical practitioners will, will consider vitamin D and calcium together. However, if your vitamin D level is quite high and if you're taking quite a lot of vitamin D, this obviously is going to increase how much calcium you're absorbing. And if you're having quite a lot of calcium in the form of supplements, this can actually push your calcium level too high. And we're actually aware of some cases where people with MS have been taking high levels of vitamin D but also high levels of calcium. And this has caused quite a lot of harm. So if anybody out there has taken quite a lot of vitamin D, I would advise caution taking high dose calcium supplements specifically. As I say, vitamin D helps you absorb that calcium. And if you're taking a lot of calcium and you're gonna absorb it even, even better than you would without the vitamin D, then that can quickly lead to problems with too much calcium. And that can be quite problematic. Um, 
the last thing I just wanted to mention about vitamin D is it does seem vitamin D is important and we still have lots of questions that we need answers to about vitamin D and on general health as well as MS health. Um, but it certainly is not a magic pill. So there's a lot of people say to me, well, I know my vitamin D levels are high. I take vitamin D all the time and I'm still not getting the, the benefit I expect. Um, vitamin D is only one aspect of, of health. Um, it's not the be all and end all. And, and talking about that, are there other supplements that uh, someone with MS should be taking? Um, so there is a huge amount of supplements available um, for all sorts of indications. Um, in general, uh, it's in the name. So a supplement should supplement a healthy diet. If the diet's good enough, there should be very little need for, for supplements. And if the diet's not good enough, the person should try and change their diet before they, they resort to supplements. However, there are some exceptions, and we've just talked about vitamin D. As I say, vitamin D is very difficult to get from your diet, um, from your diet alone, and that's why supplements are are very good, uh, very good um, alternative to um, to eating, um, you know, maybe two or three portions of fish every single day, of fatty fish like salmon every single day. Um, in terms of supplements and MS, there are some interesting uh, um, evidence coming out about biotin. Um, and biotin is actually a B vitamin, uh, a B vitamin like thiamine or folic acid, and biotin is a, is a B vitamin. It turns out that some of these studies have used a very high dose of thiamine, but what's interesting about vitamin B, B vitamins is that in contrast to vitamin D, they're water-soluble vitamins. And what that means is you can't build up a store. So if you take lots of B vitamins, you generally they will excrete them in your urine. And this is the same for, for biotin. So the first thing to say about biotin is it seems to be very safe, and that's including in the studies with MS, um, where it seems to be very well tolerated with very little side effects. One side effect does seem to be that it can interfere with some blood tests, including thyroid tests, um, which is something to be aware of. But just to put it into context, so <clears throat> the recommended daily allowance for uh, biotin is about 300 micrograms, and these studies used up to 300 milligrams which is a, a thousand times more than the recommended daily allowance. So we're going from micrograms up, to, sorry, um, yeah, micrograms up to milligrams, which is an, a, an increase of a thousand fold. Um, but as I say, it does seem quite safe. And the food sources of biotin would be things like seeds, sunflower seeds and flax seeds. Sweet potato, interestingly, is a good source as well, as are green vegetables. So, um, you know, green vegetables seems to, to be one of the best veg types of vegetables, things like spinach and, and broccoli, um, and also salmon. Fatty fish like salmon contain lots of biotin as well. Um, what's interesting is um, biotin, um, we generally don't see any uh, deficiency issues with biotin um, because it's found in so many foods and we, can, uh, we only need a very, very small amount of, of biotin. And another one, um, flaxseed oil is um, encouraged on the OMS protocol, <clears throat> isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, part of the reason, um, or a lot of the reason, is because flaxseed oil um, contains um, omega-3 fatty acids. And I know a lot of uh, the listeners will, will know quite a lot about, uh, sorry, about omega-3. So omega-3 is a, an anti-inflammatory uh, fatty acid, um, which we can get, we need to get from the diet. It's essential fatty acid. We need to get it from the diet. Um, and, and flaxseed oil is quite high in um, in, um, in in omega three fatty acids. Um, flaxseeds are, are a good alter, are a good option as well as are walnuts. But flaxseed oil contains a higher concentration of omega three than the the whole flaxseed, and um, because obviously the oil is extracted. Um, and we know that omega three does seem to be um, <clears throat> of importance when it comes to um, in, inflammation and autoimmunity as well. Um, so flaxseed uh, as a source of omega-3 seems to be a good um, a good option. And quite interestingly, most people do not get enough omega-3, um, including those with MS. Okay, so that's definitely worth adding in. And um, another one that came up relatively recently was um, vitamin K2 and how that might have some connection with vitamin D as well um, and whether it's worth supplementing with K2 as well. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> vitamin K is very, very interesting. So it's a little bit similar to, uh, to vitamin D. Uh, it turns out that vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. And 
<clears throat> again, not too dissimilar to vitamin D, there are two main forms of vitamin K. There's vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Um, and we know that vitamin K1 <clears throat> is really important for helping the blood to clot. And if any of your listeners are on medications like warfarin, um, they will know all about vitamin K and um, its importance for blood clotting. Blood clotting. Um, however, vitamin K2 does seem to have additional roles um, in the immune system for bone health and so on. It turns out that we can get lots of vitamin K1 from green vegetables and and, um, and sources such as that, um, lentils, uh, some fruits as well. Whereas vitamin K2 is a lot rarer in the diet. It's it's made by bacteria and it's found in some fermented foods and some um, animal foods. So an example of a fermented uh, plant food would be something like NATO, which is a fermented soy product. Uh, also things like sauerkraut. Uh, tempeh and kombucha um, are, are, are good sources of vitamin K2. Um, but yet you mentioned vitamin K2 working together with vitamin D. Um, it turns out that many vitamins work together really all over the body. and We call this kind of nutrient synergy. Um, and this is part of the problem with taking um, an individual supplement. But, you know, if you say, you know, let's just pick randomly. If you say vitamin C is good, well, just taking a vitamin C supplement is not the same as eating foods rich in vitamin C, but also containing other nutrients which help vitamin C work better. Um, and just to bring it back to MS, there has been some recent data showing that vitamin K levels are lower in, in MS than those who don't have MS, um, but we're not sure yet um, of the effects of increasing vitamin K2 in MS. Um, so it's definitely an area to, to keep an eye on. And for the moment, what I would uh, what I would advise is certainly eating lots of green vegetables um, for vitamin K, but also for lots of other reasons as well. And you mentioned sort of the, the uh, vitamins interacting with each other. So is it better to take a multivitamin tablet rather than taking specific vitamins? Yeah, so it's 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 another good question. And in general, I, I don't really advise multivitamins. Um, and this is because um, there are some nutrients we know can be harmful in supplementation form. Um, and these nutrients might include something like beta carotene. And if I've got time, I'll very quickly tell uh, tell a little bit of the backstory. So vitamin uh, beta carotene is the precursor to vitamin A, and it's found in, in orange and uh, and brightly coloured fruits and vegetables like um, like carrots and sweet potato and so on. So in the past, it was noted that those who had lots of beta carotene in their blood actually had a lower risk of lung cancer. So what scientists did was they found people at high risk of lung cancer. For example, people who smoke, and they, they give some people beta carotene supplements and some a placebo. And they actually found that those who took the beta carotene had a much higher risk of cancer and heart disease than those who took the placebo. Um, and that's been shown several times with, with beta carotene and with other isolated nutrients. Um, so I don't recommend a blanket multivitamin um, for most people. I recommend a good diet, such as recommended by Overcoming MS. And then targeted supplementation of things like vitamin D, um, you know, things like flaxseed oil potentially have a role as well, as well as maybe thinking about vitamin K2 and, and things like that. But I don't think a vit multivitamin is the best strategy. <clears throat> and who should be taking vitamin B12? That's another one that gets mentioned quite a lot. Yeah, so vitamin B12 is really, really very interesting. So the first thing to say about vitamin B12 is quite a lot of people following the overcoming MS protocol um, decide to forego all animal products, including fatty fish. Um, vitamin B12, the only reliable sources in the diet are animal foods. Um, so anybody who's following a vegetarian, a vegan, or even a heavily plant-based diet needs to be aware of vitamin B12 and ensure that they either take it on a daily basis in their diet or a supplement. Um, quite interestingly, in my clinical experience, lots of people who eat lots of animal products still have issues with vitamin B12, and that's because it's quite difficult to absorb. Um, so if anybody has any issues with their tummy or is on certain medications, for example, acid medications and acids and so on, this can affect your vitamin B12 absorption. And luckily, it's very easy to measure vitamin B12. And also, luckily, we only need a very, very small dose. Um, we also know that vitamin B12 is really, really important for the central nervous system, including the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and hence, it's important for MS. Um, so if anybody is concerned at all, or maybe, as I say, follows a plant-based diet, it's worth having your vitamin B12 level checked. 
And the final thing to say about vitamin B12 is because we need such a small amount, we have a store in our bodies and within our liver, which can last for about three years. So really, if you get checked and your level is okay, I maybe would check it once a year or once every 18 months. Okay. And we, so we've talked quite a lot about vitamins. What about um, minerals as well? Is there any minerals that we should be worried about or should consider supplementing? Yeah. So minerals sometimes take a back seat to, uh, to vitamins, um, but minerals are obviously really, really important too. So minerals, including things like calcium, um, really important for bone health, for heart health as well. Um, also things like potassium, really important for our blood pressure and for our nerves. But one which seems quite uh, interesting for MS is magnesium. So it turns out magnesium is really important for a huge amount of reactions in the human body. Um, but luckily, we can get it from food. And this is what I would recommend. Um, so really good sources of magnesium in the diet include things like nuts, greens, green vegetables popping up again, and also legumes and whole grains. And these are the backbones of a plant-based diet, such as um, Overcoming MS recommends. So the amount of magnesium we need on a daily basis is about three to 400 milligrams, depending on whether we're male or female and what age we are. But it turns out that a serving of any of these foods, so nuts, green vegetables, beans, or, or whole grains, even including good old-fashioned potatoes, they probably provide about 80 milligrams. So you need about three to four portions minimum of nuts or greens or beans or whole grains. And generally, most people on the Overcoming MS program should be able to, to meet that target. So three to four portions there should get all the magnesium you need. So largely, we're pretty much covering our um, vitamin and mineral requirements, apart from vitamin D and some flaxseed oil. But if we're following the OMS diet, we pretty much have got everything else covered. Yeah, so it's it's still a good idea to 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 have an idea of of what nutrients you might be short on and what sort of foods contain those. But in general, um, you know, I just say a well planned diet should should provide all nutrients, and um, one exception being vitamin D, for example. Um, another nutrient which is coming out um quite quite interesting results uh, specific to MS is vitamin A, and again, vitamin A like vitamin D is fat soluble. Um, and we can get it in, in sources such as fatty fish like salmon, but we can also, as I mentioned, get the precursor called beta carotene in lots of plant foods like carrots, like sweet potatoes, like mangoes and your green vegetables again. And it turns out these foods contain a huge amount of vitamin A or its precursor beta carotene. Um, so as long as we're consuming those um, on a regular basis, we won't have an issue with vitamin A. Um, and again, I would recommend getting it from plant sources as opposed to getting it from supplements. Is there any sort of future or current research into supplements? Is there anything that could be changing? Yeah, so I think the whole biotin area is definitely something interesting to look out for, especially because some of the research done on biotin, specific to MS, has looked at primary progressive MS, which is a, an area which is certainly lacking um, in terms of uh, supplements and MS, it's certainly a really, really interesting area, specific nutrients, specific combinations. Um, we know that, for example, in MS, things like inflammation and the immune system are certainly affected. And we know that not lots of nutrients have effects here. Um, so part of what I've been working on with my research team here in Dublin is looking at nutrients we can, which can get into the brain. And very, very briefly, we have a barrier within our body which stops most things from getting in or outside of the brain. This means, though, that beneficial nutrients that we get from, let's say, an apple will very rarely reach the brain. But there are some nutrients which can reach the brain. Um, but they're not found in, in a lot of foods and they're generally not foods we con would consume um, regularly, like on a daily basis. Um, these foods would, or sorry, these nutrients would have an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect within the brain, assuming they can get into the brain. So our research team have been uh, formulating a whole food um, product which can deliver these nutrients, and then the next step would be to see does it actually get into the brain, um, and then does it have a beneficial effect. So although it's still in the early stages of its planning, um, it, this is a really exciting area, really exciting time for us uh, on our research team, and certainly something I would be uh, delighted to keep in touch about. Okay, so it's it's not just a static thing, it's, it's actually a moving area of research as well. Absolutely. Um, science in general is, is never static, but specifically when it comes to, uh, to food and, uh, and MS, 
Um, there's a huge amount that we know, but there's a huge amount we don't know. And there's a huge amount going on to f- try and figure out um, things that we don't know. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. I think with that, we'll wrap up. Um, and um, that was very interesting information, I think, for everyone who's, um, who's following the OMS diet or is considering a um, healthier lifestyle. Great. And thank you for, uh, for your time. With that, I would like to thank you all for listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Remember that there is a wealth of information at overcomingms.org, including show notes and an archive of all Living Well with MS episodes. Once again, that's overcomingms.org. There you can also find OMS-friendly recipes and exercise tips, connect with other OMSers in your local area through our OMS Circles programme, and learn about the latest research going on in the MS world generally and related to OMS specifically. I encourage you to register on the site and stay informed about the latest news and updates. I also encourage you to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And please feel free to share it with others who might find it of value. Let us know what you think about the podcast by leaving a review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. So please contact us via our website, overcomingms.org. Thanks again for listening and for joining me on this journey to overcoming MS and living well with multiple sclerosis. I'm Jeff Alex, and I'll see you next time.